Paul Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Scott. It's very positive to run your and I congratulate the member for Birmingham on securing this in very important debate. I myself am epileptic. I have nocturnal epilepsy. I have tonic clonic seizures, which, as the gentleman explained, are the most severe form of epilepsy that we all associate with the condition. I am, for another fortnight, between the ages of 20 and 35. I am single, and for the avoidance of doubt, I therefore sleep alone. I'm also male, for the avoidance of any further doubt. And it may surprise people outside this chamber, but I work long hours in what is quite a stressful occupation. At least I think it is. So I therefore tick every possible risk box going for being, for being at risk of sudden unexplained death due to epilepsy. I go to bed knowing every night that there is a tiny, infinitesimally small chance that I could not wake up again. And that is, of course, a great concern. Now, I realise that anyone with epilepsy has a 24 times greater chance of sudden death than the normal population. If you are particularly at risk of SUDIP, you're then 23 times more likely again to experience that sudden death. And that always preys on the mind, understandably. It's bound to. But what concerns me more than anything else is the fact that I did not learn of all these risks at the time of my diagnosis. I discovered them because I happened to Google it. I sat on my computer with a chill going over me, thinking, my goodness, I never knew about this. I never knew any of this could possibly occur. And that is a wider concern, I know, because I've met many families, including a constituent of mine, Avril Walker, who lost her son Christopher at the age of 19 to, to Sudip. And I've met many families through Epilepsy Bereaved and Jane Hannah. And they all say the same thing, that they have a sense of anguish, naturally, at the loss of a loved one. That is entirely understandable. But for many of them, they have a much greater sense of frustration that no one, at the time of diagnosis, explained the risks of SUDIP to them. And if they had but known that, they could at least have sought to take some of the mitigating activities that can be undertaken to try to reduce that level of risk. And I know what they can be. Before my diagnosis, when the epilepsy was not controlled, I managed to throw myself down the stairs. I woke up with my head in a fridge, in a washing machine, in an oven, thankfully not turned on. I threw myself out of bed, hit my head on the side of my bedside cabinet, made a large gash only just above the eye, went down to A&E and was told, oh, you've just been drinking too much. The irony being, of course, that the trigger for my epilepsy is the consumption of any alcohol. That's what makes it so difficult to control is if any alcohol appears in any food at all and no one knows about it, I will have a seizure in the night. Thankfully, I adhere to my medicine. And that's why it's important that we actually find out at the time of diagnosis because there is no greater impetus towards adhering to your medication than the knowledge of what might happen if you don't. The most sacrosanct thing in my life is ensuring I have my medicine, I have my pills. And it can be quite difficult when you live essentially a double life as I do, down here half the week, up in Blackpool the other half of the week, to make sure I have my little packet of pills that I carry around with me. Panic ensues if I am without those pills. I have to rush down to the Victoria Walking Centre to get an extra prescription and can I complain to the government about shutting it in a month's time. Sorry, I will have to give way. Sorry, have it. Great interest, the Honourable Gentleman, talking about his personal experience. These debates are always enhanced by that sort of contribution. Is, does he think there's a particular reason why doctors are unwilling to tell people diagnosed with epilepsy of the risk of, of sudden death? I thank you for that pertinent um, intervention, which I was intending to come on to. I think all doctors dislike dispensing bad news. It's the least um, enjoyable, it's perhaps the wrong word, the least fulfilling part of the job, perhaps. And I'm sure, from the doctors I have spoken to, there are those who think that the moment of diagnosis 
it's not necessarily the appropriate moment to start having a detailed discussion about, oh, and by the way, you're 23 times more likely to die now, so th you need to do this, this, and this. However, I think it does underline the importance of having epilepsy specialist nurses in particular, who can have a more structured conversation one or two weeks later, once people have got over the shock of the diagnosis, because it is a shock. When I was diagnosed in my early 20s, I, I had no idea when I went to the doctors that morning that he was going to tell me I had epilepsy and I was left stunned by the news. And that might not have been the most appropriate time to start to go through, and by the way, you've got all this to deal with as well. Nonetheless, I think it is vitally important that at some point, pretty soon after diagnosis, that structured conversation does occur because there are mitigating things that can be done. Even if it's just blunting the sharp corners of your bedside cabinet or lowering the height of the bed or putting a child gate above the stairs because if you know what things are likely to occur and you can at least try, to, or one rather, can, can at least try to um, mitigate them in my view. But it does also underline the dramatic importance of adhering to medication. And if the young people in particular who are most susceptible to this, many of them live what, you might, what one might call chaotic lives. They don't always pick up their medication. If they're away at university, they aren't under parental control. Um, one can't monitor precisely their, their, their medicinal intake. So if they are aware of what the risks are, that degree of self-discipline might be brought into play that would ensure that they stick to their medicine regime. Because I've heard time and time again that the, these deaths in particular seem to occur in a university setting in particular. And that does concern me that um, one needs to try to get the self-discipline in at as early a stage as possible. And I think the diagnosis process and the explanation process is fundamental to that. Um, certainly, I also think that when the worst does occur, and tragically it will occur, one can never iron out all the risks entirely. There needs to be a much better post-death process because the family are naturally shocked, particularly if they're not expecting this and haven't been made aware of the risk factors. There's a degree of a lack of awareness amongst the coroner's services, the police, there can be nothing worse than finding your child's bedroom turned into a crime scene because the police aren't aware of the potential of sudden death from epilepsy. All of that, I think, can be much better handled if instructions are coming down from on high. The coroner's service in particular needs to, I think, make a list of national charities that do deal with sudden death that families can turn to for help. I think that would be of great assistance because so many simply don't know where to turn. But fundamentally, and this is the one thing I would beg the Minister to try and do, is to try to encourage the medical profession to make sure that either at diagnosis if they feel it appropriate, or within a fortnight or so, some conversation is had by some medical professional to explain these risks. That alone, I think, would make much more difference than a conspiracy of silence that leaves those with the epilepsy to find out about it for themselves. Because if that conversation occurs, at least people can try to take the actions they need to take to protect themselves. And that, I think, would make the most difference of all. So thank you very much.